we can turn our Bibles again to uh, the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 2, and I'd like to direct your attention to verse 27 and 28. Mark 2, verse 27 and 28. And Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Well, congregation, we are continuing our sermon series, The Law of God. And this morning we are looking at the fourth commandment, and also this afternoon as well, we'll be doing uh, really a two part um, series on this, uh, set on this fourth commandment. And uh, so far, just to recap, we've seen that the first table of the law is primarily concerned with loving the Lord our God and with his worship as well. Uh, the first commandment we saw that we are to worship the right God and him alone. Only worship the triune God. The second commandment was about worshiping that God rightly. The third commandment was about worshiping God reverently. And now here in the fourth commandment, we're hearing that it's about worshiping God regularly. And so notice that our commandment said, that the fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now children, the word Sabbath Uh, It simply means rest or cessation, to stop, to rest. And the word holy means set apart. And so remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That is, the Sabbath day is a special day of rest that's to be set apart from every other day in our week. It's an entire day that's devoted to God. It's God's special day. Every day is God's, of course, but the Lord's day is is especially his day. But as we uh, stress that this command is about God's worship, the regularity of God's worship, we need to recognize that the fourth commandment doesn't merely deal with one day of the week. Uh, In fact, it deals with all the days uh, in the week, all of our time. And so in this commandment, God is laying claim to all of our time. Uh, He gets to tell us how we are to use our time. And so he organizes our week for us. And so if we're to summarize, this commandment is about the structuring of all of our time and the regularity of God's worship. We'll be fleshing that out in greater detail this afternoon. But unlike the other commandments which we've seen so far, we can't just right away jump into the meaning and application of this one. And that is because uh, this commandment has been broadly swept aside, not only by the society and culture in which we live, but by the church itself. Uh, We know that uh, most churches, um, even most evangelical churches, do not uh, keep the fourth commandment. Uh, They see, and and according to their understanding, they think that because Christ has come, this fourth commandment was merely a shadow. And in the coming of Christ, Uh, The shadows are done away, and therefore there is nothing binding about this fourth commandment anymore. And so the assumption that's made is that the fourth commandment only had ceremonial and civil applications. That is, that the fourth commandment was only about uh, the ceremonial law that God had given to Israel, and that it was only about the nation of Israel. And so... People will even look to Jesus uh, as the one who maybe broke the Sabbath, saying, pointing to him and saying, look it, uh, even Christ did not keep the Sabbath, and so we don't need to keep it anymore either. Well, these are the concerns that we want to deal with this morning. And the key question then for us is, is the fourth commandment still binding upon us? Is the fourth commandment still binding upon us? Or to put it another way, Is the fourth commandment a part of God's moral law? Or is it merely ceremonial and civil? And as we come to our text here in Mark 2, did Jesus really break the fourth commandment? So those are the things we're looking at this morning. Our title is The Abiding Nature of the Sabbath. 
And the first point we'll see is the Lord uproots false teaching. The Lord uproots false teaching concerning the Sabbath. In the second place, we'll see the Lord roots it in creation. He roots his teaching in creation. The third point, the Lord roots his teaching in redemption. So the abiding nature of the Sabbath. And first of all, the Lord uproots false teaching concerning this day. Well, children, our text begins with uh, Jesus walking with his uh, closest friends and closest followers uh, through the fields, and it's the Sabbath day. And as they walk along, you can see that the disciples are hungry, and they reach over to the grain, and they pick some of the grain and start to eat it on their journey. Now, uh, this wasn't stealing, just to be clear. In fact, in in the Old Testament laws, God had commanded that the farmers, to, uh, that they leave the borders of the fields for such people who were journeying by. This was part of God's good provision. And so the disciples aren't stealing here, and, and yet they are challenged. Uh, Jesus himself is challenged. You see that in verse 24. Uh, the Pharisees, they watch what's happening. They watch the disciples eating the grain And they say to Jesus, look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And so you see that the key issue here is the Sabbath and what is lawful on uh, on that day. But really behind the issue of, uh, of the Sabbath day is the challenge to Christ's own identity. That's a major point that uh, the Gospel of Mark is making, the identity of Jesus Christ. And so if you read through chapter 2, you'll see how Christ, uh, how his identity has been repeatedly challenged by the Pharisees and by the scribes already. So you go back to chapter 2, verse 7, and there you read, uh, when Jesus pronounces the forgiveness of sins to the paralyzed man, the scribes are, are saying in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And so already the Pharisees are recognizing what Jesus is claiming for himself about who he is, and they're resisting it. They see that Jesus is claiming to be God, and they don't like uh, that claim at all. And so you can see how their minds are working. If Jesus really is God, then he's the lawgiver. And if he's the lawgiver, how can he tolerate his disciples breaking this Sabbath commandment? Well, as you'll see, this is no little theological debate. If you go to the end of the story in chapter 3, verse 6, you'll notice that they want to kill him over this matter. And so this is a major controversy. Verse 6 says, Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. And so it's in this heated context that the Lord gives us some of his clearest teaching on the fourth commandment, on the Sabbath day, and on how to keep it. And and the first work that Jesus must do before he set about to teaching the truth about the Sabbath is that the first thing he needs to do is uproot all of the weeds that have grown around this great uh, gift that God had given. All of these life-choking weeds that, that the Pharisees had sown around this day, making it a burdensome day for the people. And so here is the lawgiver. He has shown up, uh, the Lord God himself, in the flesh as a, as a fully uh, human. And he is here now teaching, restoring the good and life-giving intention of this gift of the Sabbath. And so he begins by tearing down the Pharisees' man-made rules. And that is absolutely essential then for us to understand as we come to Christ's teaching. We need to recognize that when Jesus is battling with the Pharisees, as he frequently does over the Sabbath day, that Jesus is not breaking the Sabbath or, or getting rid of the Sabbath. But Jesus is breaking the man-made traditions that have been creeping up around this Sabbath day, these extra laws. And so Jesus never broke the Sabbath. 
Uh, This was a misunderstanding of what Christ was doing. In fact, Jesus went out of his way to keep the Sabbath. Uh, Luke 4, verse 16 tells us uh, how Jesus, when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and it says there, as it was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And so it was Jesus' custom, his habit, to go into the synagogue, into the place of worship, to hear God's law and to read God's law. It was his special day of worship. In Jesus' life, he sought to keep the Sabbath. But even more, as I said, whenever we see Jesus breaking rules regarding the Sabbath, he's breaking the man-made Sabbath traditions. And he's doing this so that he might restore the beauty and the goodness of this gift of the Sabbath. And so that's what we see here in our text as well. Notice the Pharisees' question. They, they ask him, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And so their concern is that, that word lawful. Why do they do that which is not lawful, that which is against the law? And the question we need to ask is against whose law? Whose law are the disciples breaking? And the assumption we so often make is that they're breaking the Old Testament laws, that they're breaking God's law. But in fact, they aren't. They aren't breaking God's law as they walk through the fields and pluck this corn to feed themselves. The Old Testament never forbid people from picking grain on the Sabbath day. Uh, The closest you get to something like that is Exodus 34, verse 21, where it forbids uh, working during harvest season. But the point of Exodus 34, verse 21, if you read it, it's clear that God is forbidding working on the Sabbath during harvest season and during plowing season and during planting season, meaning that even in the busy days of our lives, the busy seasons of our lives, when our work life is busy, We still need to guard the Sabbath day. That was the point of Exodus 34, 21. But the Pharisees, they had latched on to that and then extended it further and made their own traditions, their own commands, their own rules. How do we keep Exodus 34, 21? And then they added their own laws, their own definitions. And what they had come up with was that no one could even pluck a head of grain if they were hungry And they were on a journey on the Sabbath day. And so this was the Pharisees' law. This was the Pharisees' tradition. And this was the law that they were judging by. They were judging by their own man-made standards. And so when they see the disciples plucking the heads of grain, and they say, how can they do that which is unlawful? They're They're not judging based on God's law. They're judging based on their own conceptions, their own rule book that they had set up, their own traditions. And so throughout the course of his ministry, Jesus intentionally goes out of his way even to break these man-made laws. And he does so publicly. You see that in in what we read in chapter 3. Jesus publicly calls this sick man forward in front of them that they would see the man being healed. Jesus could have healed the man in, in, a, in a corner, away from everyone's attention, but he doesn't do that. He brings the man front and center to make his point that the Pharisees' extra laws regarding the Sabbath day were life-destroying. And so Jesus smashes down these extra man-made laws with the truth about the goodness of the Sabbath day. And so that's what he's doing here in our text as well. You see that he responds this, uh, this way in verse 25. He says, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. And so Jesus here, he uses an example from David's life. And and children, you remember how King David, before he was king, uh, he often lived on the run. 
He was trying to escape from Saul and his life was often in danger. And there was that one instance where it was the Sabbath day, or sorry, excuse me, where he was in hunger and in need. And so he went into the tabernacle and he asked to eat the showbread, which was reserved only for the priests. And the priest gave it to him to preserve his life. And there, the Old Testament story illustrates this fact that the moral principle of preserving life outweighed the symbolic nature of the showbread. The moral principle of preserving life it outweighed just the symbolic nature of the showbread. And so here's the point that Jesus is making. Here's the point that we need to hear, that Jesus, he isn't defending the disciples' actions by saying, you're right, uh, he, we just need to disregard the Old Testament and, and, and leave that aside. No, but he is doing the opposite. Jesus is appealing to the Old Testament to demonstrate that his disciples were acting in line with God's law, with the true intention of God's law. And so here he is, and he's upholding the right interpretation of the law. And so if we come to this text and we think that Jesus is somehow downplaying the Sabbath or, or casting a negative light upon the Sabbath, realize that, that we are misunderstanding his purposes here. Jesus is appealing to the Old Testament and Old Testament examples to uphold Old Testament scripture and to restore the goodness of this day. And so he's saying the Sabbath was not meant to be a cruel tyrant that is ruling over man and sucking the life out of men, just like the Pharisees had made it to be. And so here he is, he steps up and he defends his disciples. Here we see uh, Jesus, the protector of his people, the guardian of his flock, the one who is uh, shielding his people from their attacks, from his enemies' attacks. And he's doing so by showing the foolishness of the Pharisees' own laws. And so the Lord, he uproots false teaching concerning the Sabbath. And this is the same thing, we don't have the time, but this is the same thing that the Apostle Paul does then in, the, in his letters as well to the churches. You think of Colossians, for example. And there he, he uses, it sounds like negative language of the Sabbath, but what he is fighting against is the abuse of that day and making that day uh, a means for justification, for our right standing before God. And Paul then is saying, well, I'll have none of that. And so he's uprooting the false teaching, just as our Lord Jesus Christ is doing here. He's tilling the ground. He, he's, he's uprooting the weeds before he sows the seeds of the truth. And so we need to stop and ask ourselves this question as well. Does the Lord need to do some uprooting with us? Does the Lord need to do some uprooting with us? Have we let our own traditions suck the life and joy out of this good and, and glorious day that he has given to us? And so our major point for this sermon is to, to go against uh, the mainstream uh, Christianity that says there's no such thing as a good Sabbath. That's the main point of the sermon. But right now, we need to ask ourselves this question. Have we allowed our man-made traditions uh, become our rules that, that, that then burden us and, and cause us uh, to cast off this day? Well, we'll see that having cleared the misunderstandings, Jesus shows us the true nature of the day. And the first way he does that is by going back to creation. And that takes us to our second point then. The Lord uproots the false teaching, but second, the Lord roots the, his right teaching in creation. And you see that in verse 27. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. And so notice here that Jesus is rooting the Sabbath in creation. He's reminding the Pharisees that it was one of God's good creation ordinances. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so by saying this, Jesus wants us to think of the creation story. He wants us to go back in our Bibles to, to the very beginning 
and to see how God in his goodness ordered and structured creation. And you know how God made man first on the sixth day. God made man first and then God rested on the seventh day. And so there is this priority, this God made man and then he gave to man the Sabbath. That's what Jesus is wanting us to see. And the Lord rested on the Sabbath day, not on the seventh day, not because he was tired or weary of his work of creation. Uh, Children, we know that uh, the Lord never tires, he never wearies. Uh, Creation was an easy act for him. It was easy for him to say, let there be light, and and then there was light. It was easy for him to place the stars in, in all of their positions, to put the planets in the right place. That was easy for the Lord. He didn't need to rest. But he chose to rest, and he did so for the good of humanity, to set a pattern, a pattern for humanity, to give us a way of ordering our lives. And so this was the Lord in his goodness giving a precious gift to mankind. And that's important to notice uh, Jesus' inclusive language. Notice he says, the Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made for mankind. The Sabbath was made for humanity. He's using a general term here. He doesn't say that the Sabbath was made for the Jews. He doesn't say that the Sabbath was made for God's covenant people. No, he says the Sabbath was made for humanity, for man, for mankind. This was God's gift, God's good gift in creation to all humanity. And so here's the point. When we think about the Sabbath, we can't just go back to Exodus. And we can't just dismiss it as an old covenant shadow that's done away with in the new covenant. Because Jesus doesn't just go to Exodus. Jesus goes to Genesis, to Genesis 1 and 2. And here he shows us that the the Sabbath is rooted in creation itself. God has made the Sabbath and given it as a gift to mankind, as a creation ordinance. And so this clearly tells us that this fourth commandment is not merely ceremonial. It's not merely a civil law, but it is a moral law. This is a law upon which all of humanity will be judged. Just think about that. All of us, yes, we'll be judged for breaking the first commandment, for worshiping false gods. We'll be be judged for breaking the sixth commandment, for murdering others. But all of humanity, our neighbors, uh, uh, everyone around us, we will be judged according to the fourth commandment as well. Have you kept the Sabbath day holy? And so that's something we need to recognize because we live... In a day and age where we don't even blink when those around us break this commandment. Maybe we don't blink when we break this commandment. But then we look at others and we don't blink when they break it. It, It's no big deal, we think. Of course they will break it. And yet, would we think that if they were murdering others? or, or, Or cheating on their spouse? Committing adultery? Well, this is a moral law just like those other commands. And so the Sabbath is binding on all people at all times and in all places. And so in speaking this way, Jesus isn't teaching us anything new. I hope we see that as well. In speaking this way, in in going back to creation, Jesus isn't teaching us anything new. He's not doing anything uh, creative here or extraordinary as it were. He's not pulling a fast one on the Pharisees. Uh, He's not inventing some new teaching, but what he is doing is actually directing our gaze back to the Old Testament, back to the Ten Commandments, back to Exodus chapter 20, because there even in Exodus 20, we see how God has rooted this commandment in the creation itself. There in Exodus 20, we, we read uh, how the Lord has, has, has given, he, he calls us to keep this, this day holy, and then he gives the reason, why should we keep this day holy? And the answer is for 
In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. And so even as God, as the Lord is giving his law to his people through Moses, he's directing their gaze back to Genesis, back to the creation. And he's saying, this isn't something new. I'm not inventing this here at Mount Sinai, but I have ordered this into creation itself. And so since this was a moral law, that means it was, it was wrong to break the Sabbath day even before Exodus 20. It was wrong to break the Sabbath day before Exodus 20. That's why you read in Exodus 16, and God is, is judging the people for breaking the Sabbath day when they're gathering manna on the Sabbath day. It was wrong before Exodus 20, and that's because it's not It's not a new added law. No, it is a creation ordinance. This fourth commandment is rooted in creation itself. If you you read Genesis 2, verse 3, it says says that then God blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And so notice the language there. God has just created everything in six days. The seventh day he rested. Genesis 2 verse 3, then God blessed the Sabbath day. God didn't bless the Sabbath day in Exodus 20. He wasn't doing something new in Exodus 20. He blessed it in Genesis 2 in his creation. And so that again shows us that this is a moral law. And it's an abiding law as well. And we see that also in Jesus' own own words. He says that in our text, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. There's a maker behind the Sabbath, a good creator, a good maker, one who knows his creature's needs. And so this creator made this day of rest. And so what does that say of us if we are, are casting aside and, and, and setting aside this, this God-given rest day as if we don't need it? Well, we are telling our Creator that we are wiser than Him. We are telling our Creator that we know ourselves better than He knows us. And so we don't need a day of rest. In congregation, that is acting the part of a fool if we think we know ourselves better than God knows us. No, we are finite. We need rest. And the Lord in his goodness has given us this opportunity to rest on the Sabbath day. And so the Sabbath was made for man. Jesus is saying the Sabbath is one of God's good gifts. And so we we are to see the goodness and care of our creator in this day. But Jesus also takes his argument a step further. Not only does he root it in creation, but he also roots it in redemption. And so, yes, all of of humanity is to keep this the Sabbath day because God is our creator, but Christians especially then are to keep the Sabbath day because of redemption. And that's the point Jesus makes in verse 28. Mark 2, 28, he says, Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And we see Christ connecting his teaching to redemption in the title that he uses for himself. The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now you'll remember, if we think back to our Daniel series, Daniel chapter 7, uh, this is where Jesus is, is grounding his teaching on the Son of Man. Jan- Daniel 7, verse 13, where Daniel sees the vision of the one who is like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And there we commented in our sermon on the Son of Man that this is a messianic title. We need to recognize that this title, Son of Man, we often hear it as as Jesus saying, I'm just a man, I'm weak. But that's not what Christ is saying. Yes, he he is identifying himself with humanity, but it's a messianic title. It's a title that speaks of his messianic identity. It tells us who he is. 
He's the Messiah. That is, he's the Christ. He's the anointed one. God's anointed king. God's supreme king. God's king who's going to win the victory over God's enemies and receive that everlasting kingdom, just like Daniel prophesied in Daniel 7, 14. And so this is why Jesus loves this title so much. It's his favorite title. He keeps using it of himself. I believe it's 82 times he says I, uh, he takes this title to himself. And we've seen it already in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, if you go back to chapter 1, uh, verse 15, he comes and he's preaching the kingdom of God. He's preaching the kingdom of God. And, and it's as if he's saying, I, the king is here. I am here. The Messiah is here. And so repent and believe. And then in chapter 2, after forgiving the, the paralyzed man's sins, you see in verse 10, he says, Know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And so you see, even here in this chapter, Christ is connecting the Son of Man and the forgiveness of sins. This is a redemptive title. This title, it, it signals to us what he is all about. It tells us about his person, but also about his work. That he has come to deal with God's enemies, yes, with Satan, yes, with the grave, with death, but also with sin. He has come to deal with sin. And so know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And so this title, it reveals his redemptive mission. It tells us what he's here for. Jesus is the Son of Man. He is God incarnate, God in the flesh, God taking on a fully human nature and becoming the second Adam, the second man, so that he might save his people, that he might live that life of, of perfect law-keeping and then die the, the, the lawbreaker's death. This is what is all bound up in this title. He is the Messiah. And therefore, he's telling us of his mission and his redemption. As the Son of Man, he's come to die on a cross for, sins, for the sins of his people. As the Son of Man, he will rise again in victory. As the Son of Man, he will ascend back into glory, just like Daniel fore, foresaw and, and foretold. He will ascend into glory and receive God's kingdom. And so all of that is in Jesus' mind. It's all filled into this title as he uses it here in our text. He says, Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And so it's with redemption in mind, with redemption in mind that Jesus asserts his lordship over the Sabbath day. It's as the Savior of men that Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. That's the point. The Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. And so this makes perfect sense if we think about the context again. What have the Pharisees done? Well, through their own man-made laws, they have distorted the Sabbath, and in doing so, they had distorted everyone's view of God. Right? Keeping the Sabbath, the Lord's, keeping the Lord's day, the Sabbath day, keeping it holy, that was a burdensome thing. That was, that was, that was a, a hard thing. It was, it was difficult. It was, it, there was no joy in that. There was no joy in that. And so what were they saying about God? They were casting a, re a reflection on God. And so here comes Jesus. Here comes God. Here comes the lawgiver. Here comes the Savior, the Redeemer. And he's, he's restoring the, the view and the right teaching of the Sabbath so that people might see who God is as well. And so he's showing us that it's a reflection of his good character. And it's a picture of the spiritual life and joy that he brings. And so I ask you, what's your view of God? Do you know this Christ? Do you know the Son of Man? And do you, do you know him in truth? Do you know God in truth? That, 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 that is, do you know him in a way in which he is your greatest joy, your greatest pleasure? He is, he is the pearl of great price, the all-satisfying one. Or are you like the Pharisees who 
who have, who have changed the view of God so that keeping the Sabbath day is dull and boring and restrictive because your view of God is dull and boring and restrictive. Well, congregation, this Christ here, he un- uproots the false teaching so that we might see the beauty of the Sabbath and in seeing the beauty of the Sabbath that we might see the beauty of of the God behind the Sabbath. He is life. He is joy. He is salvation. And so embrace him and find that, yes, in him is fullness of joy and in his presence there are pleasures forevermore. But what a claim Christ is making here. He says he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. And if we just go back to the Old Testament again and remember what Deuteronomy 5 says in the giving of the law. Deuteronomy 5 verse 14, it says, The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. The Sabbath belongs to God. And yet here is Jesus in our text and he is saying, The Sabbath belongs to me. Do you hear the claim that he is making? I am the Son of Man. I am the Lord your God who gave you this day to keep. And so in in using this language, we're also brought back to Deuteronomy 5 where where God himself, the Lord, in the first giving, uh, excuse me, in the second giving of the law, rooted the law in redemption as well. As we read, they were to keep, the old covenant people were to keep this day out of a remembrance of the fact that they had been redeemed out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of bondage. And if we know anything of the Exodus, and and as we read our Old Testament, we see that the Exodus was the chief act of redemption that God performed in the Old Testament. And so the Old Testament prophets are always looking back at the Exodus and praying to the Lord, Lord, send us another Exodus. And then prophesying, you read Isaiah, and Isaiah's prophesying of a second Exodus that will occur. And that second Exodus finds its climax in Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus Christ destroying his enemies. Jesus Christ purchasing his people through his own life and blood. Jesus Christ being the greater Passover lamb, shedding his blood so that his people might go free, free from sin, free from Satan, free from the fear of death. Jesus redeemed them. And so if the old covenant people were called to keep the Sabbath because of creation and even also because of redemption, how much more God's people in the New Testament. On this side of the cross, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. It's His day. It's the Lord's day. Christ has authority over it. This day is about Christ, and He has authority over it. And the New Testament church recognized that as well. And so they recognize how when He rose from the dead in victory on the first day of the week, the day changed. Yes, the day itself being uh, the seventh or the first, that was circumstantial. But the moral principle itself, that remained. The principle remained that this day, the first day now, is is the day of triumph. It's the day of the new creation. Jesus' resurrection is, is the new creation, as it were, bursting forth into the old. And here he is, rising in victory. And so the New Testament church called it the Lord's Day. You see that in Acts 20, verse 7, the New Testament church gathering on the Lord's Day, on the first day of the week. Or Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, calling the churches in Corinth to lay aside extra collections on the first day of the week. Or you see John in Revelations 1, Revelation 1, verse 10, and John is in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, on the Sabbath, on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, Christ's resurrection Yes, it has changed things. It has changed the day of the week whereby we celebrate this. But the only other change that it has given for us is that it now gives us even more reason to give God glory on this day. It's his victory day. It's the Lord's day. And so as we live in the already not yet dynamic of his kingdom, yes, the king has come. The kingdom of God is here. Yet we wait the final consummation when he will bring in the fullness of his kingdom 
And in this interim time, Christ in his goodness has given not only to humanity, but especially to his people, the Sabbath, the Lord's Day, as a means for remembering and celebrating his glorious work of creation and especially his saving work of redemption. And so as we close, this fourth commandment, it still applies to us. I hope that is clear by now. This fourth commandment, it still applies to us. There is, there, there is the abiding nature of the Sabbath. And so even in our context, even in our day, we are called to keep this day holy. And that's what we will then look at this afternoon with the Lord's help. Amen.